meeting of the planning board to obtain um, feedback from the public on two items. The first is uh, preservation of historic resources in Middletown, and the second is uh, the promotion of enhanced fire protection measures. Um, for both items, we will get presentations from the staff, and then there will be uh, it will be open for discussion by uh, board members and members of the public. So whoever is going to present first on. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So on this first one, historic preservation, uh, Kevin Proft uh, actually did the, the bulk of the work, did the bulk of the work on the um, draft that you have before you. Uh, so he's pr uh, produced a PowerPoint presentation, which he'll walk you through. And then, as you said, we'll have opportunity for discussion Q&A um, after the presentation. So I'll. I'll run the slideshow for Kevin. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> so we're going to talk about the uh, draft of the Historic Resources Preservation Ordinance uh, that we've been developing over the past couple months uh, in the planning office. Um, the main reason that we got started on this is because the comprehensive plan called for uh, the planning board to take action to protect some of Middletown's historic resources. Uh, we decided that we'd come up with an incentive type program uh, so that property owners could uh, preserve their resources. And when we say resources, we're talking about mainly uh, historic and architecturally significant structures, um, historic landscapes, historic sites, historic landmarks, and archeological sites. You can go to that. So uh, first of all, we decided that we would uh, create an incentive program rather than a historic district, um, kind of a more traditional historic district like, like Newport might have. So this is uh, not a historic district. Instead, it's a um, way of offering incentives to property owners so that they can uh, be better stewards of their properties uh, if they want them. Uh, if property owners don't want to pursue the incentives, uh, there's no pressure on them to do so and they can go on uh, living as if this, this ordinance doesn't exist. Um, so we just wanted to make that clear from the start. Uh, in terms of the administration of the program, we would uh, be creating a Historic Resources Preser Preservation Board to be five members uh, with two alternates that it uh, serve, uh, I think it was four year terms in the, in the ordinance, staggered so that they're not all coming on and off at the same time. Uh, the board would meet monthly or as necessary to review applications and complete the other uh, work that is uh, laid out for them in, in the ordinance um, that we've drafted. Uh, in terms of eligible properties, uh, the resources board that's created would uh, create a list of historic resources that we call the Middletown Historic Resources List. Uh, it would include, uh, like we said earlier, historic structures as well as historic uh, landmarks and um, uh, military sites, archaeological sites. So the list would, would encompass all of the town's historic resources. Uh, properties on that list would then be eligible for incentives uh, that are described in the ordinance that we'll get to in, in a few minutes. So I, I just chime in here that that list will be, ba it's not going to be, be uh, created out of whole cloth. It's going to be based on some work that's been done in the past to identify historic resources in town. Um, BJ has documents um, that she's provided to, to us uh, as we were looking at drafting this ordinance. So that would be a starting point for this Historic Resources Board in identifying the properties and, um, and, the, and the resources that might be eligible to participate in the program. Um, I get a question earlier this week about, well, what about National Register properties? And, and certainly those properties, I would expect, would be part of this list of, of historic resources that would be eligible uh, for the program. Can I ask, did, didn't we, 
I know the I know the thrust of this is for properties and, and resources like that, but didn't wasn't there any ever discussion on the documents or some? Yeah, <clears throat> so we uh, I there are historical documents that we want to at least archive make, and arc make part of this ordinance somehow, but it's not the thrust of what we're trying to yeah, do. Yeah, I think uh, in, in the ordinance we say that the uh, one of the responsibilities of the board will be to create uh, other non-incentive based programs okay. uh, where they're working with the Middletown Historical Society to uh, preserve like the other town resources that don't readily you know, fit into these kind of tax credit type. Uh, um, right, the non-incentivized, that's, that's right. the key, right? Yeah. But the documents, that was part of what our, our meetings were on too. Included. That's correct. But this is the thrust of what we do. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so the historic resources list will uh, be divided into uh, both primary and secondary resources. And the reason we do this is because uh, for some resources, we may want to offer larger incentives than for other resources. Uh, the proposed primary resources currently would be historic and architecturally significant structures. Uh, and pr proposed secondary resources would be des uh, designed landscapes. So that's like maybe if a famous uh, landscape architect has, has created a uh, landscape or park uh, that that might fit under the um, definition of a design landscape uh, sites so military sites cemeteries landmarks um, including stone walls and archaeological sites so the those primary and secondary resources could get shuffled around a little bit depending on what the uh, historic resources resources board uh, thinks when they take a look at this, maybe they think that uh, landmarks should also be a, a primary resource. That'll be for them to decide. But this is this is how it'll go forward um, currently, and then it'll be the one of the board's initial responsibilities to see if they kind of agree with this. The way we've put these uh, resources into buckets and and adjust them as uh, they see fit. So. Uh, the incentives that are going to be available, there's there's three different incentives that will be available to uh, property owners that uh, own these historic resources. The first one is the annual historic resource of preservation property tax credit. So this is a uh, property, property owners can enter into a 10-year contract with the uh, town if they agree to preserve their historic structure for the uh, term of that 10-year uh, ten-year contract. Um, they would get a 10% credit in return for doing that uh, if they have a primary resource, so a, a structure, uh, and a 5% credit if they have a secondary resource, like a um, you know uh, cemetery or something like that on their property. Uh, the in, in order to prevent these tax these tax credits from getting overly large, uh, the highest tax credit that will be available will be 10% of uh, the median home's annual property tax. So that if you have uh, you know, any home up to the median price, you'll get the full 10%. But then as, as you get higher and higher, uh, you'll, you'll really just be topping out at the median home's uh, uh, level of tax credit. Um, during the 10-year term of the contract, uh, maintenance projects that you're going to perform on your home or renovations that you're going to perform on your home would have to uh, be kind of historically accurate. Uh, and you would present your maintenance project to the Historic Resources Board prior to doing it if you're, if you're under one of these contracts. And they would have to approve that project before you uh, began construction. Um, if you fail to maintain your home in a historic manner uh, during the course of that 10-year project, the, the town would uh, have the ability to recoup the lost tax uh, revenue that they have credited you over that 10-year term uh, and, and terminate the contract. So if you do um, you know, a renovation to, your, to the exterior of your home uh, that's just not in keeping with the uh, historic nature of the home um, and you've agreed to one of these 10-year contracts and then the town would, would have the opportunity to get the money that they'd lost back and, uh, and, and terminate the contract. Uh, yeah. Dr. Eighth, I'd like to talk about that. Sure. 
who is going to define exactly what the architectural definition is for a project? And I tell you that because I've had several real estate transactions in Newport in the historic districts which have involved the selection of a paint color for the home or a door, trying to replace windows from 1798 with modern windows, uh, it's a struggle. And sometimes the definitions seem to vary from person to person. Are we going to clearly delineate what we mean by historical detail and those kind of issues? Yeah, so uh, again, one of the initial um, uh, responsibilities that the board will have will be to set standards for both the uh, historic structures and the um, and then and then kind of the other historic resources for the historic structures we're recommending that the uh, board and, and it's in the ordinance it'll be in the ordinance and, and I guess that'd be their purview they could could make changes to uh, their standards if they'd like to but we're recommending that they would go with the Department of the Interior's uh, standards for historic preservation which would um, you know explain what you can and can't do with your historic windows and chances are the historic resource board would not um, you know approve a change from historic windows to a modern double pane window even if it looked to the average person like uh, like that window was, was basically the same because they would say that the integrity and the craftsmanship of that window is not uh, you know what it, what it was when it was historic. So the reason that we went with the incentive program instead of the historic district is that in the historic district you'd, if you owned that home you'd really be required to replace your windows in kind if you were going to make any kind of res, uh, uh, renovation to your home. With the incentive program if you decide you want double paned windows and to replace your you know uh, single pane 19 or, or, or 1700 windows that are rotting out uh, you're welcome to do that you just won't be able to capitalize on the, on the incentives of the historic uh, preservation incentives and really one of the reasons that you have these incentives is exactly the reason you're talking about the historic windows are probably going to be more expensive to replace than the uh, than, than to replace them with modern double pane windows <coughs> So these tax credits are helping property owners that otherwise might say, I just can't afford to put these you know, historic windows in, uh, give them a little bit of extra pocket money so that they can do that. Thank you. Kevin, um, looking at this slide, uh, yes. the median home price varies every year. Right. So is this the median home price when the contract is initiated? I, I, I would imagine that I can talk to the best. I can talk to the maybe the tax assessor to find out what the best way to to do this is, or or the person that would be um, calculating the credits. But I would guess that it'd be different every year. So the if you have a so how how I mean the the simple calculation that you've shown assumes it's the same every year. Yeah. So so that would be. For example, for this year or wherever I got that number from, I don't know if that was from the, the census in 2010, I don't remember exactly. It was just an example. But 10% uh, of the median home price might be 394, you know, the median home might be 394,000 this year, it might be 400,000 next yes. year. And in that case, if it was 400,000. Your tax credit might be slightly larger next year. So the tax credit is going to change every year? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, it would be 10%. It'd be 10 percent of whatever the I mean, well. A, this is also yeah. So it might be easier to administer if if you make it the median home price at the time the contract is signed and just hold it fixed. Yeah, that that. I, I think it's also something as, as Kevin mentioned. We could talk to George Durian and, and yeah, see, get his thoughts sure. on it. Okay. I think with regard to some of the other uh, programs that they run in the tax department, I, I think that that information readily available on an yeah. annual basis um, for some of the other things, but we yeah. should, we'll get it the way. Yeah, I can ask. Uh, and also, the it, it, would, it, it would still probably be a significant portion of the people that are asking for the incentives, but the median home price really only comes into play if you own a home greater than the median home price. So if you own a home that's uh, worth $250,000, uh, and that home price isn't going up from year to year, then, then the property tax would be based on 10% of the 250, and the median home price wouldn't even come into, the, come into play. But yeah, I think it is, it's certainly worth asking uh, the tax assessor to find out what the best way to administer that is. 
how come it's not based on the assessed value of the house instead of the median value of uh, some house? What's that? How come it's not based on the assessed value of the house, you know, instead of the median value? So it would be based on the assessed value of the house up until you reach the median, uh, up until you reach the, the median home price for, or the median assessed value for the, the town. And the reason for that is so that you don't have uh, like a $2 million home, the 10% credit would be much larger. And uh, to prevent the town from losing the tax revenue and to prevent the town from giving large tax breaks to people that maybe don't need tax breaks in order to replace their historic windows, um, it's, it's both of those, just yeah. so it's a little bit more progressive in its nature and uh, to avoid giving, forfeiting too much tax revenue. And it, it is all, it's gonna be based on the assessed value, so home price probably isn't the best terminology. Um, it, it's gonna be based on assessed value. Language, I think, it reflects that in the ordinance. I will make sure that it does, yeah. <clears throat> and if, Ron, if you just go back, so just to give you an idea, the maximum, uh, the maximum tax credit that we're talking about uh, is 600 and, you know, around $600. Uh, per year, and then you figure it's over a 10-year contract, so you're at about $6,000 uh, over 10 years um, in return for a guarantee that uh, a historic structure is not going to be, uh, you know, either renovated in, in a non-historical fashion or uh, destroyed within that 10-year period. Uh, so that's kind of the trade-off, $6,000 for the 10-year promise. Uh, so the second uh, tax incentive, uh, which can be combined with the first tax incentive, is uh, a rehabilitation property tax uh, and fee reduction. So here uh, we're saying that if you want to do a uh, historic um, renovation or rehabilitation on your home, uh, you can apply for this tax credit and you'll receive uh, a tax reduction in, in that, that year's taxes. Uh, equal to 10% for a, a primary resource, a, a structure, or 5% for a secondary resource, if that's what you're renovating. Uh, you'll receive a tax uh, reduction of 10% of the cost of the maintenance project that you're doing. So if you're doing a uh, $10,000 uh, maintenance project on your home and it's historic, you know, historically accurate, you can apply for this credit and you'll get uh, what $1,000 back at the end of the year. Um, in terms of a, a tax credit. Uh, the cost of your um, construction permit fees would also be reduced by uh, 50% um, if it's directly related to the project that you're doing. Uh, and the limit would be 100% uh, of an annual property tax uh, for a home or 100% of the median home's property tax uh, whichever is less. So again, if you're at, uh, you know, a $250,000 home, you'll get, you can have up to 100% of your property tax for that year uh, uh, credited. But if you have a home that's, again, over 400,000, you know, 450,000, then you're going to cap out at whatever the, the value for that median home would have been. Uh, the uh, only things that'll be eligible for this property tax credit is the exterior maintenance projects of a home, um, which in historic districts is usually how it works. Uh, in, in Newport, you don't get, uh, you aren't required to maintain your, you know, interior historic uh, aspects of your home. It's really just about the exterior uh, building. Um, um, I, again, just calculated what the tax credits might look like. Uh, if you have a $350,000 home and uh, you pay $5,400 in taxes on that home every year and you do a maintenance project that is uh, $40,000 total, then you'd get a tax reduction at 10% uh, of $40,000, which would be a $4,000 uh, uh, tax credit at the end of the year. Um, if your maintenance project is $60,000, um, 
then 10% of that would be 6,000, which is higher than your overall property tax credit for that year. So then it just caps out at that year's property tax credit to be $5,400. So you do 100% of the property tax rather than the 10% of the project in that case. Uh, the maximum credit, again, based on a you know median, I guess, assessed value of 394,000 uh, would be approximately $6,000. Um, and it would be a one-year tax credit for that you know, individual project that you did. So that could include uh, basic things like, say you had to put in a roof on it or siding or things like that. Is that what you're thinking about? Yeah, if you were going to replace your wood siding, uh, that that would qualify. If you have like a slate roof that needs to be replaced, that that would qualify. If you're going to be replacing your windows, that would qualify. Okay. Um, th those are the kind of things, yeah, that we're talking about. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> All right, so the third one is a density bonus. This is more for developers than individual property owners. And the idea here is that if you have, uh, for example, like a uh, piece of agricultural land with like a historic farmstead on it, uh, and a developer comes in and they say, well, I want to you know, subdivide this and put 10 homes on it. If they agree uh, during that process to maintain the historic farmstead as part of the uh, development plan, uh, then they would get a density bonus of uh, one dwelling unit. So it, it basically what that comes down to is they would be able to keep that historic farmstead and still develop 10 new uh, properties instead of uh, maybe instead being forced to demolish that farmstead so that they would be able to put up 10 properties. So it would preserve the uh, the farmstead and also allow them to, to develop 10 properties. So they would, they would really be selling 11 dwelling units on a uh, piece of land that was really only zoned to have 10 dwelling units on it. Um, Kevin, quick, yes. question on that. Um, is there any language in the ordinance that we're proposing or suggesting that the density is one thing, and I, I support that, but uh, still meeting the uh, other zoning requirements for that property. Is it, do we have language in there? Do you know, follow me, uh, Pete or Ron? Yeah, I think, well, I think the only... Because this apply, is going to apply to the next discussion we're going to have, but uh, we've we got to be clear that we cover the... Cover the well, yeah, so in this, in this case, it would be... Uh, you would have a smaller lot size probably for each of the 11 units. If we're talking about it was supposed to be developed for 10, now you're going to have 11. You'd have to have a smaller lot size for each unit, but it's it's also likely that it'd be a conservation development where all of the lot sizes would be smaller anyway. Sure, I, but I guess what I'm asking is we're not giving them approval here to to get reduced lot sizes, which to, which don't mean zoning, for the sake of getting an extra, extra, an extra lot. They still need to have, they still are going to need to meet lot size requirements well, well I, think, I think what they're saying is, is if I have a piece of land where if I tear down a farmhouse, I can get 10 conforming lots. Um, the idea is we'll, we'll give you 10 lots if you keep the farmhouse, so you'll end up having a total of 11. So okay. there probably would have to be some language in there in terms of... Okay, so giving them some variances that we can't give them, mm -hmm. but they have to have... There needs to be language, I would think, to cover the the ability for them to get those that relief within reason. Yes, which, I is, which is not in here now okay. because we're at the preliminary stage where okay. the, you know the board says they want to move forward with these all of these assemblies. That we so it would it would have to get tied to the zoning ordinance somehow. So there'd be a provision, a section in the zoning ordinance referencing this program. I support that. But I know we're not that far yet, but I, I do support that concept. Thank you. If there's, a, if there's no utilities in the area, like there's no water, there's no sewer, you know, is there, uh, would he still be able to get the extra lot? Uh, what about stormwater requirements? I mean, suppose he can't meet the stormwater requirements. Well, you'd have to meet the requirements. Yeah. So, so I mean, as Bill said, you're going to meet all the other requirements anyway. So if, if we're saying you can go from 10 to 11, but you, you can only get 10 septic systems in. And you're going to be limited. You're, you're, going, to, you're going to be stuck. So, um. well, maybe you could put in a residential sprinkler and get that bonus. In. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're not there yet. I'm don't sorry. jump on <laughs> um, I, I think the, the example 
uh, that, I, that I took this density bonus from was the town of Exeter, and they did have um, a, they did have this in both their regulations and their zoning ordinance. So it, it kind of cross-referenced each other, uh, so that so that the zoning ordinance said that the planning board or, the planning board could grant this density bonus, basically. Okay. Yeah. But, but you conceivably could have a situation where it won't work. Yeah. Because sure, of course. Mm -hmm. Kevin, on this uh, density question, when, uh, when I look at the wording in the draft, it says, uh, should a developer choose to preserve and rehabilitate an existing historic or architecturally significant structure included on the historic resources list? This means that if um, this property has a structure on it that is not on the list, they would have to apply to get it on the list first and then they could uh, uh, put forth a plan to get an extra um, structure? Yeah, I, I guess so. Uh, I hadn't thought too much about the board accepting kind of uh, petitions to have homes added to the list uh, as much as they would set the list and, and that would kind of uh, be the official list from from there on out. But if uh, if the owner of the farmstead felt that their farm had been overlooked uh, when the board was drafting its list of historic resources, I guess there there should be a way yeah. for them to be able to yeah, come before absolutely. the board and yeah, say, I, uh, I want to be part of this list. Yeah. The other question I had there is that. Um, it goes on to say that the applicant uh, can exceed the basic maximum number of permitted dwelling units in the development by one. Uh, is that for any number of units? I mean, if, if, if there is a lot that, that would normally have one unit allowable, does that mean they could have two? I think that we set, we set it at six or more. So this would only apply to a major subdivision on the right. development project? So it wouldn't apply to a what about the case of a uh, building that's identified by our board <clears throat> has to be historic and the owner does not want to participate in the program and all of a sudden he wants to sell the property and the new developer wants to tear the existing designated historic building down what happens can, in that can you repeat the beginning can't do it you can it, tear it down okay no there's, it, a, there's a deed restriction but if they're, if you get the bonus, if you get the density bonus, if you get, get the bonus, if you get the density, yeah, you get the bonus. I'm sorry, I misunderstood if you yeah. said if it hadn't been. But you're going to get, you, you might get somebody that says, hey, it's a great program, but it's not for me. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And then you lose the building. Okay. Yeah, most of these things we would have, um, we would have to record. I think even if you're, for example, even if you're just an, on a 10 year contract, you'd want to record something. Oh, yeah. yeah. Be sold during that time frame. New buyers on notice that there may be a recapture of some of that tax credit if they take the property out of the program in a 10 year period. Right. So, so that prohibition in the, the however the deed is written, it would run with the land. Is that the idea? Okay. So we'd have to get the land evidence recorded yeah. somehow. So. I, I don't see the restriction to major subdivisions in here. So make sure that's in there somewhere, Kevin. Okay. Uh, I, I, th I think it is. Um, in my quick perusal, I didn't see it. But I will, I will double yeah, check. Yeah, just make sure it's in there. So the, the, just so I'm clear, the concern would be you don't want a situation where a two or a three lot subdivision yeah. gets an extra lot. Yeah, I, that's what All I was right. thinking of, okay. right. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, it's an extra lot, not an extra, not necessarily an extra unit. Well, that's, that's what I meant. Yeah. 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 Is that Kevin? Um, no. Yeah, well, can you just go back for a second, Ron? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so then the last thing was what, uh, what Ron was just talking about, where uh, if you, as a developer, uh, take this uh, uh, density bonus incentive, then the farmhouse uh, has to have some kind of deed restriction put on it and, and 
you know, maybe some kind of uh, historic easement put on it so that a future owner cannot uh, tear that down so it'll be preserved in perpetuity, kind of like a conservation easement would be for open space. All right, thanks, Ron. Okay, some additional items in the uh, draft uh, that don't fit into any of the, uh, the headings that we already talked about. Um, the property owner can receive both the annual property tax reduction, uh, so the, the 10 year, 10% 10 deal, and a project based property tax reduction, so the 10% of any given you know, construction project. Uh, if they take both of them, the property tax uh, reduction can't be greater than. Uh, the total property tax for, for that year. Uh, so it maxes out at 100. We're not going to be paying uh, property owners back. <laughs> They're not going to be getting uh, kind of reverse credits at the end of the year. Uh, the standards and guidelines, again, will for the US, uh, for the structures, will be using the US Interior Department um, in all likelihood as the standard. Uh, and then for other resources, I know the U.S. Interior Department actually has some standards for other resources as well, but I think we'd leave it up to the Historic Resources Board to determine what the best standards are or if they want to have, uh, you know, write their own standards for things like historic cemeteries and the other resources besides structures. Um, publicly owned historic resources. Uh, in the draft, we've, we've said that publicly owned resources will be uh, preserved in a historic fashion. Uh, and if they're sold, uh, the town will, preserve, uh, will ensure that the preservation of those resources continues into the future with the new owner. Uh, again, maybe through some kind of uh, deed restriction. Um, and finally, the board may develop uh, additional programs, and this is kind of what Bill was talking about, to pr help preserve the town's other historic resources. Um, and this could be a public awareness program, you know, just getting the word out about our, our historic uh, resources, uh, or it could be uh, preserving archival documents, which was one of the suggestions that came up in the subcommittee meetings, working in tandem with the Historic Society, which I guess also does a lot of this stuff. Um, and that's, that's mentioned in the, uh, in the ordinance here. Um, so I think that that's it. So if you have any more questions from the board or, or anybody from the audience that's interested in this, I'd, I'd be happy to take them now. Well, let, let's um, get co questions and comments from the board first. Any other comments from the board? I do have a question. Go ahead. Um, so, Kevin, back to number three again, incentive number three. Yep. Uh, Which is the uh, uh, density bonus. Correct. So I like the idea of that. I, I do support it, and I do like the idea of preserving and rehabilitating. Is there any language uh, further than just putting lipstick on a pig, if you will? Uh, in other words, we can't, they can make it look pretty, but it, I mean, yeah, so the way that it'll work is that uh, when they are going through the development uh, review process, the land development process, uh, they will uh, have to work with the resources board, that's the historic resources board that's going to be created through this ordinance, and they're going to say, you know, these are the things that you need to do in order to Bring meet to the requirements level. to get this density bonus, and, and that'll be based it. again on the uh, standards that they have, which are going to be uh, in the interior department standards for rehabilitating. So maybe so. a key word to include in there is preserve, rehabilitate, and maintain, because mm -hmm. that's where I think they run into issues. Okay. okay. For, for uh, publicly owned property, uh, so uh, if uh, publicly owned property property is on a historic list, suppose it's it's in use as uh, for some sort of you know, purpose uh, for one of the agencies in town. And suppose the t agency decides to, uh, it needs a bigger facility and the only place to uh, put it is on the existing site, you know, where the historic property is. Does the town have some sort of obligation to preserve that property or to, uh, you know, according to this ordinance? According to this draft, the town would uh, be required to preserve any historic properties that are listed on the historic properties list. So it's not to say that another facility couldn't be constructed or there couldn't be a renovation to the facility to add to it, but you would be required, based on the language here, and you know it's, it's a draft, but you would be required to, to preserve the historic structure. I think this building has a historic structure in the front and then has had 
you know, renovations added to the back of it over the years. Uh, so that, that could be uh, one way of getting around that. But that's, that's currently what the ordinance says is that uh, if the building is on the historic resources list, then it would have to be preserved by the town. Other comments or questions from the board members? BJ? Yes, I have a comment to make. And it says here in my draft, members of the board shall be residents of the town of Middletown, and the board shall include at least one member of the Middletown Historical Society. If a member of that group is willing to serve, I don't think that there would be anything that would uh, negate that. However, I do not think that um, there should be conflict as to what the Middletown Historical Society does and what the board does. And I think that that's a very important uh, consideration there. So if there's a member on the uh, Historic Resources Board making sure that they're not conflicted between their two roles? Yes, yes, because the Historical Society does uh, does do archives and things like that, and they would have a great deal of information about the town and the various um, uh, homes or buildings or whatever you want to call it uh, that could be included in this. And I cannot see that the board would be overly, uh, what's the word, uh, that, that there would be lots and lots of people signing up for this initially. Because how many people do we have in the town? 16,000 or something? Yeah. And not everyone lives in a historic home. Do you see this as a problem? Uh, no, I don't think it is a potential problem, but it would be interesting to hear what the society feels. Other comments or questions, Bill? Yes, yeah, sorry to go back to another another one. I, I like the discussion we had on the historic resource list that is established by the board. You, you did make a note. We need to because it's a it's a kind of a a, a um, fluid list that could be added to. Obviously, the board can't capture every property, and some of those properties may come to light. And the, there needs to be a mechanism in place mm -hmm. to allow for the, these resources to be added secondary or primary right so I'm just yep yeah I've made it I made a note of that that I'll I'll add some language that says that the board should come up with a uh, uh, procedure for uh, people to be able to petition them to have their property added the I think the, uh, the the document that we ended up settling on as the uh, baseline for the town for the for the board to maybe start building out from was that 1979 Oh, yes. uh, document, which was kind of a complete, it was, it was called a preliminary, I think, uh, uh, preliminary survey of historic structures in the town uh, by statewide planning, but I don't think they ever came back and did anything but the preliminary one. Um, but that one seemed to be the most um, uh, complete in terms of the surveys and inventories yeah. inventories completed. So I think that they would take that document, go out and see which of those structures are still, uh, you know, maybe on a case by case basis, they'd go out and they'd see which of those structures are still, um, you know, there, which ones have not been renovated in a way that kind of makes them no longer uh, historic properties and, and then build out from, from there. Yeah, you need that initial list to start. And then I'd like to, I'd like to think that somewhere down the line, my home will be historic and my heirs will be able to apply to make right. it historic. A hundred years from now. hundred years from now. Right. <laughs> right. But it can be historic just because you live there. That's right. This is true. Yes. This is true. So I can apply it can now. Be, it can be historic by architecture. The William. Or, uh, or just association. This is true. The William Nash Homestead. <laughs> Other questions or comments? No, but I think that this is a case by case. I think that that's the most important words to be used for this uh, board. Yeah. Board has that discretion. Um, I, I have a couple of uh, comments on the draft itself. Kevin, sure. do, you, do you have the draft in front of you? There? I do. Yes. Yeah. Um, when, when we were working up this draft, uh, the understanding was that this board would 
uh, be supported by the staff from the planning department. Does that have to be in there somewhere? Uh, I can I can say it explicitly. A few times it, re it references uh, that the it's, it says the board can, be, can delegate things to the planning department staff, but yeah, that's things should be submitted to the planning department, things like that. But I could put a specific. Yeah, I, I, this I, will be staffed by yeah. the planning department. And then there's uh, one other thing I want to uh, revisit. When this was first being discussed, the original draft um, said that one member of the historic board uh, should be a member of the planning board. If you remember the original draft. The original, yes. But we have a very different planning board now, and I would like to make sure that this planning board um, agrees with the removal of that. The old planning board said that wasn't necessary, but I'd like to get a sense of this board if you feel the same way or you, you'd like to have a member of the historic board be a member. Yeah, so originally we, we, yeah, so originally we were going to say that one member would have to be from the Middletown Historical Society and one member would have to be a, a sitting planning board member, but then we took that second one off because the old, the old board uh, kind of felt like, you know, we're, we're stretched thin as it is and we don't necessarily yeah. uh, want to be, have our, our hand forced in that way. So, um, but yeah, we can. So for that reason, the, the, the planning board said one member doesn't have to be and I would just like to know if the new board feels the same way. I feel this. It doesn't have to be. Doesn't have to be, Michael? So, uh, so we're saying that the uh, what member was of the planning board does not have to be part of this. That's group. what the draft says now. Huh? Okay. Could there be a liaison from the planning well, board? I mean, I mean, with that, we with could that always we could always that. have a liaison at a later time. Oh. What this is addressing is oh. one, one member must be a member of the planning board. How do you feel, Joe? Well, my thoughts on it are that uh, you know at this initial stage, I don't see it necessary. Yeah. All right. So let's leave the draft the way it okay. is. Okay. And um, I have one other question, and that is um, um, right after the section on the density bonus, there's a section on enforcement. And it, the last draft that I saw, it didn't specify who was yeah. going to enforce this. So have, have you? I think I just had to talk to Ron about it, and it's still it's still uh, X X X X. Uh, That's so. yet to be determined. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, so I think the, the way that I the way that I envision it being enforced, and whether or not this is realistic, I'm not certain. Uh, would be that for each of these incentives, there would be a check-in with the uh, Historic Resources Board um, in the 10-year contract. You would check in at five years and submit photos to the Resources Board that show your house and show that nothing has gone off the rails in terms of you putting on a addition or, or whatever the case may be and then you check in again at the 10 year mark uh, and then assuming that you know the the historic resources board says yeah this looks okay you continue to get your tax credit uh, for the construction one you would submit with your application for the 10 percent back on your construction project the second uh, incentive you would submit photos and documentation of what the uh, home looks like before the construction project and then when you've completed the project you'd submit photos again and if you uh, you know uh, met the requirements or, or, or done the construction project as planned then you'll be awarded the incentive as planned uh, and for the third one again it'd be with the developer you would uh, have you know um, basically the same thing you'd have photos before and then photos after to show the renovations as they've been completed. Uh, and once you have proven that you've done what you said you were going to do, you would, well, without when you get the density bonus. I'm not sure what, what you, <laughs> I'm well, not the, sure exactly the, how. The, so the next, it's, if, if we. Um, so you would, you would have these check-ins with the board and then if the board found in one case that that wasn't, that there was an issue that made, I don't know if the building inspector then can be asked to follow up and yeah, well, the solicitor just suggested to me that it, it, would, say is it would have to be tied in with the building inspection department so that they're yeah. aware of, or they make us aware of. Yeah, so if someone goes to pull a permit on a property that's under a historic contract, that ought to be flagged at the mm -hmm. time the yeah. building right. permit application goes in so you'll be aware of whether they're in compliance or not. Yeah. Ron, assuming the, um, 
uh, planning board decides to go forward with this, what would the next step be? Um, well, well, you need to take some public input tonight. Yeah, That's I, the reason I, I for the meeting. I um, so that. let's I do that. I understand um, that, but what once, would the next step be? Well, the next step is to revise the draft based on the discussion tonight, yeah. get it into a more final form with the help of the solicitor. Again, you know, we've got things like having to tie it to the zoning ordinance. And, and then do we have a public hearing before it goes? <coughs> Excuse me, eventually. We I would have a public I hearing? Would, I would have a, public, a formal okay, public hearing. Okay, so could hearing. I request then that that next draft address this enforcement issue and make sure it's in the draft? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Could I have uh, uh, anyone in the public who would like to provide some feedback or input on this? Please come forward. Come to the microphone, state your name and address, please. Hi. Uh, which one do I use? Oh, against this one. Uh, my, my name is Mary Dennis, and I live at 1052 East Main Road, and I'm part of the Middletown Historical Society. Uh, what I'd like to mention is the stone walls, because uh, everybody's concentrating on the houses, which is great. Okay. Uh, the Middletown Historical Society back in the 1990s put together a stone wall recognition program. Okay. And they have a mission statement, they have qualifications, there's a whole process here. And what they did was they gave out certificates to people in the town who kept up their stone wall and you know, made sure things, I think BJ has one, that um, they would give out. We're in the process right now of resurrecting that program. The two gentlemen that put it together and really ran it, uh, both passed away. So, um, We've dusted off all the records and pulled them all out. There's over 50 properties in the town that were recognized for their historic stone walls. I'm taking it that this would be part of this program, that people who keep up their stone walls, they take, you know, as far as keeping them good and tight, making sure there's not vines in them and trees growing in them and they're not falling over. Is this part of the program that they would be qualified to get some type of a tax benefit? Because it's funny, I've been thinking of contacting other towns because some of the other towns in Rhode Island do recognize property owners who keep up their stone So any, anyone that's participating in your program, getting a certificate or otherwise, could apply, could apply, could to, apply to this program for okay. the incentive. Yeah, yeah. yeah I so, mean, I'm sitting here listening and it seems like the two of us kind of really need to work together. Yeah. That, that's um, th been this the thought list, from the beginning. Yeah, this, yeah. this the list of homes um, should be the same, I would think. I mean, our, our list of homes and your list of homes and businesses. And I was wondering, would Oliphant School fall under this? Do you know? <laughs> it, if it ends up on the list, yes. <laughs> okay. Is there going to be a, uh, a criteria? a specific written down criteria that people could come in to the town hall, pick up and just read it to know if they possibly could fall under this? Yes. There's going to be exact yeah, so guidelines? Yes, when, when the board is constant, when the resources board is constituted, that'll be one of their initial responsibilities is to uh, determine what a, his, what all of the historic resources are. So what, okay. what definition is, you know, what's the definition for a historic structure? What's the definition for an architecturally significant structure? What's the definition for a design landscape? And then we'll be able to, you know, like okay. you said, have a handout where people can come in and, and see if they think their property falls within that. Are the, you going to take, like, will your criteria get put together and then there'll be a discussion on that on regards to information going, are you putting that together and there's no discussion from outside as to whether it's felt to be? Yeah, I would imagine that there'd be a discussion from outside so that, Right now, the way it is in the ordinances, it just says, um, you know, an initial responsibility is to define historic structure, architecturally significant structure, and that's all it says. But uh, you know, presumably, they they. I mean, I think this is a great idea. And, you know, and I think like that the ordinance specifically says, you know, collaborate with Middletown Historical Society where appropriate. Okay. So. Okay. Uh, I think that we're looking for input from the historical society and, and right. No, that's great. I, yeah. I I would appreciate that. I, yeah. I think we we need to kind of work together on this. With um, the, and then the other the other question I have, which is the, like the elephant in the room that nobody ever wants to talk about, is that it's a ta it's a tax reduction. So you're going to pull money out of the tax budget. Um, do you have any figures as to what kind of money is going to be removed from the tax revenue? Because the town's going to have to make it up somewhere. Right. Has that been, I mean, that is an issue. I, you know, I mean, we don't like to talk about it, we, you know, but 
this is very important, but it is going to have an impact. Mm -hmm. And I don't even know how, if, you, if it's possible to dig at some kind of an idea to present to the town council of how much money yeah, right. this okay. could be a, a, you know, an opening. That's okay. Can I just the, uh, oh, yeah. just uh, <clears throat> to go back to the, the stone walls? I think that right now we have them kind of falling under historic landmarks, and they'd be under that secondary um, secondary resource category, which would be a uh, I think five percent credit over ten years, or five percent of any given like restoration project. If somebody wants to uh, restore their stone wall. Uh, and there's going to be an X cost to have a, a stone wall builder come in and, and do that, then they could apply and, uh, and get 5% of that project cost back. So, Kevin, uh, along that same line, the, there, are, there are standards that they have already developed that allow them to present the certificate for a structurally significant stone wall. So those should be referenced. And so should also the uh, Stonewall Ordinance, right? Isn't, the, isn't don't we have a Stonewall Ordinance that should be referenced also in there? Yeah. So the um, standards for stone walls specifically could just be whatever the standards are sure. for reaching this certification. And the ordinance that's already written. Yeah. For stone walls. I have a suggestion, Kevin. Uh, it's looking at what the historical society has already done, and I've made a list on the back of my copy uh, of all the structures, and it's a place to start looking at the structures, and there may be some other resources that could be possible inclusions. Right. Just a suggestion. Yeah. I, I think the intent is for this board, when it's formed, to work very closely with the Middletown Historic Society because they've been there for a while now and they've got a good head start on it. And I think uh, this board, should it be formed, could benefit greatly by it. And that was our hope that they would, which is why we say at least one member should be on this commission. So. And I think that they, we did have a couple of people, or I don't know if it was a couple of people or the same person a couple of times come in to the subcommittee meetings when we were drafting this to, to get some input from them on on you know what they thought and how they could help and how how we could collaborate you know kind of mutually yeah B bj that list yes. you have of properties is interesting to me i think when we get to a public showing of this maybe having some examples of some photos of that would be helpful to the public or at mm -hmm. least to me anyway to say hey this is this is how we envision it this is how we see this property fitting into this this program so maybe people might be can nice get to it. Give notice to um, people whose properties might be on that list. Yeah, that's, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that's a way to jump start it. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. um, that's a good more. idea. I like that. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, other comments from the public? I'm Teresa Santos, two fourteen Morrison Avenue, and a member of the Middletown Historical Society. I've been told by our town solicitor, I cannot ask questions, I cannot speak. What I am here for, I am going to donate, the society is donating another book to the planning board. But you've got to realize there are, in here, there are some that have already been destroyed. And there are buildings that are not in here that were destroyed before this book was built, was uh, printed. So, compliments of the- Thank you so much. Very interesting. Thank you very much. I do too, actually. I have one too. Yeah. 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 An updated draft based on the discussions yep. from We've this We've got some meeting. questions to answer, some uh, 
revisions to make, so we'll, we'll be working on revising, finalizing the draft along with the solicitor's office. And, and then it will come to the board to set a date for a public hearing? For a formal hearing, right. Okay, very good. Great work, Kevin. Do you need us to yes, uh, nice. make a motion on that? We're all no. set, okay. So, so I, guess, I guess I have a question. Uh, I happen to have a 200-foot stone wall behind my house, which is 300 years old, which I rebuilt. So I hope there's going to be a giant incentive, tax-wise for me, <laughs> and other people who have preserved stone walls. I've already given Art, he put his name on it for the stone wall. <laughs> Suitable for framing. There you go. All right, let's move on to the second agenda item. Uh, discuss possible amendments to the Middletown rules and regulations regarding the subdivision and development of land to promote enhanced fire protection measures for new development, such as installation of fire cisterns and residential fire sprinklers. Ron. So this idea uh, was brought to the board, I think, by the staff as a uh, recognition of what's been going on in, in recent times when we receive applications for, uh, in, in most cases, major subdivisions that are occurring in parts of town without public water, oftentimes uh, through the TRC process and with the participation of the fire department, applicants are asked to install cisterns, um, fire protection water cisterns, as part of their developments to provide some water supply, uh, again, for fire, uh, firefighting uh, in those parts of town. Developers have not um, balked at that. Um, I think they understand, too, that there's benefit uh, to their properties, to their developments, to having uh, that fire protection on the property. So that hasn't been an issue. There's been, uh, it, I can't remember anybody that said that they wouldn't do it or were arguing about it. So recognizing that, the uh, idea came that perhaps we should consider making it a requirement of the uh, subdivision regulations that in those situations the cisterns uh, be provided. And then of course as that conversation went, then we, we started talking about residential uh, sprinklers as well as being um, perhaps a preferred alternative or, or they could be uh, work uh, in conjunction with each other, these two ideas. So that's, that's I guess, a baseline as to where this is all coming from. Um, so the subcommittee uh, that worked on this uh, came up with uh, a draft. So you, you have the draft document and the PowerPoint that I'll go through just um, has some of the highlights and then we can talk about it. The first thing that sort of, I guess, obvious to most people. It, it, re it would require that if you're in a part of town that has public water, that you have fire hydrants installed. Um, this this is sort of, again, it's, it's kind of a no-brainer, and it's something that happens in any, any application that we get for uh, even commercial developments. Um, where there might not be a hydrant in the, in, already in the location where the project's happening and there is public water, the, the, the plans will provide fire hydrants and the fire department weighs in again at the TRC review stage to determine or, or recommend location and number of fire hydrants. Uh, so this ordi ordinance would just formalize that. Um, cisterns, I mean, the definition of what a cistern is, uh, if you don't know, it's, it's a large tank um, that's installed underground. It can be made of, of concrete, uh, fiberglass, uh, forms of plastic, um, so there's um, alternatives and, and perhaps one of the discussions we can have as to whether the regulation should do, uh, define which type of cistern the town would like. Um, I guess I'll just note that at this point, I <coughs> excuse me, today I received some uh, additional comments from the fire department and not necessarily specific to the design of the cistern, but they provided some um, references to NFPA, National Fire Protection Association, I guess? Yes, um, correct. Yes. So um, they're asking, uh, the fire chief is asking that the ordinance reference uh, the standards for mm -hmm. design and also maintenance. He was concerned about maintenance requirements that they also reference the NFPA um, requirements. So I made a note to myself that we can revise the draft to include that reference. Yep. Good. Mr. Team D. Yes. 
Um, so this, this slide just basically uh, repeats what I just said, that they're not currently required, but um, oftentimes they are being installed and that the developers uh, have generally complied. So the proposal um, of the ordinance would be that where public water is not available, um, that cisterns would be required to be installed. Um, again, the NFPA standard, I think it was what the fire department would like us to follow. Um, we have on the ad, sort of the ad hoc process that we've been using, the, we at the TRC level, the fire department will indicate um, what size um, they, they prefer, um, how much water they need. And, and, and I think one recent case, they've asked for two cisterns um, with a total of you know whatever many gallons. So whether it's specified in the ordinance itself or it could be left more open-ended and have that process on a case-by-case -case basis with the fire department advising as to what, um, what the requirement should be. I think it would be cleaner to have <clears throat> some type of a standard do, the, do, no. the, do we know if the standards that the fire chief was talking about have uh, have size based uh, on the number of dwelling units or anything? I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. That, that might be within. We need to yeah, reference yeah. the standard. Yeah. yeah. Because we can't have. I mean, we just can't have any. You know, kind of so arbitrary. That's fine. So we'll we can work more with the fire chief yeah, to. I'm sure they they must have a standard. Yeah. yeah. I'm sure NFPA has a standard on cisterns. Yeah. Okay. Um, this is uh, something I think most of us already know. If you can see the blue, the blue lines on the map are water mains, um, and you can see where there aren't blue lines. Um, those are the areas of town that this issue typically comes up with uh, subdivisions on the east side of town. So, as, as I mentioned, um, as we were talking about cisterns, uh, I think. The chairman was, was one of the first ones, and perhaps the vice chairman, to raise the issue of also looking at fire sprinklers as, a, as an, either an alternative or to, as another op option and, and opportunity to provide enhanced fire protection in new developments. Um, so the, Kevin actually pulled some of these uh, statistics together, um, information about the benefits of fire sprinklers. So I'm not going to read that, but. But there's, there's another benefit that is not included there. Uh, residential sprinklers are designed to be fast responding and to maintain a tenable atmosphere in the room of origin mm -hmm. for 10 minutes, which is very important because that gives time for people to uh, uh, escape if something happens. And that's a very important uh, aspect of residential sprinklers that doesn't get a lot of publicity. But that is a requirement for residential sprinklers. Sure. So the U.S. in Bill, Bill knows much more about this than, than I do, but uh, U.S. Model Building Code includes sprinklers uh, that state, state of Rhode Island code has not adopted the same requirements. That's correct, yes. Uh, Rhode Island is actually, as of May 1st, uh, under the 2015 IRC. So uh, actually it's a three month period, so May 1st to August 1st. Um, it'll be under the 15, but yes, uh, Rhode Island has pulled that requirement out. They've amended this model code, the state code now does not, re still does not require yeah. it to be done. So, so we can't exceed, we can't require it. But we can do what but this ordinance has suggested yes. is, is an incentive program. You can incentivize right. it or strong, yeah. Yeah, so what, jumping right into that, what this ordinance is proposing um, is where, where, I mean, sprinklers are required in certain situations, obviously, uh, multifamily uh, commercial situations, but for situations where sprinklers aren't required, the town uh, under this ordinance would, or regulation, this would be a regulation in the subdivision regulation, sub, subdivision and development regulations, would provide an incentive for installing uh, fire sprinklers. Um, again, these, as with the last uh, discussion, these are very much preliminary um, incentives, options that the board can consider, um, where fire sprinklers are um, proposed by a developer, 
in a, in a part of town uh, where they might otherwise be required to put a cistern, they could be relieved of that cistern requirement, again, in exchange for providing the sprinklers. Uh, the regulations could also provide a, an incentive for reduced road width in situations where water uh, fire sprinklers are provided, talking is, about fire protection and access. Is there a benefit to the homeowner for, uh, with insurance costs and things like that if they have the sprinkler system? There is. No yeah. doubt. Yes. Yes. Yep. Yep. So the other, uh, I'll let you finish, Ron, go ahead. Um, looking at the road maximum dead end road length, our, our regulations actually don't have a maximum length. It's a, it, the way the regulation reads, it's on a case-by-case -case basis. The planning board has the ability to determine what the maximum length of a dead-end street should be. The idea with this incentive would be that the board would take that into account when you're considering how long a, a dead-end road could be. You would take into account that there are sprinklers. Same with the single access. You know, that, that's another one, sure. Yep. A single access uh, development. Uh, another suggestion was to waive the fire department review fees. Um, I think Bill was the one that brought up the idea of providing a density bonus, and we haven't yet um, come up with what that bonus would look like, but the idea that if you install fire sprinklers in all of the uh, dwelling units, homes in a particular development, you might be offered a density bonus. And then, you know, the, the last item, any suggestions? So we'd be happy to uh, talk about any other ideas yeah. for incentives. You say 10%, one for every 10? We, that was one of the, I think that was one that was suggested. Yeah. I think we, we needed to start somewhere and maybe do some research on, on that. But so that's, that's kind of, I think, I guess the big picture here is we, we are looking to propose to offer some significant incentives to do this. You know, make, make it worth their while to do this. Well, I, I think a developer is brain dead unless he does the sprinkler option. He already gets a built-in density bonus because he doesn't have to devote any property to a cistern or two. So, uh, and the other incentive seems to make sense. And I, I, I yeah, think that with what Paul said about the fire saving extra 10 minutes, I mean, it's, we got to do this. I mean, this yeah, is no, the way to go. I don't disagree, uh, Art, and I, but I think to, to kind of bring, the, bring these proposed incentives into play. Um, I certainly, so full disclosure, I'm not a big cistern fan. Um, without getting into the real nitty gritty of cisterns, I've learned that they are, they're here to stay and they are the kind of the, 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 um, the method of choice when it comes to fire suppression in these types of developments. So um, many other towns use them and use them as, as opportunities. So I'm more focused on the incentive part of it, obviously. Um, I like the, uh, the, the 20 foot reduction, uh, including curbs, the dead end, the single access developments. Um, certainly, I think I mentioned last time, fire department plan review fees and also because it's a, a building code, a building permit, the building permit fees, but just as important when we're on the fees is it, what is the impact fee? Is, is there something we can do with the impact fee? That's, that's something we can talk with. There, there is an impact fee right now, right. so developers who are building new homes are required to pay an impact fee, a portion of which goes to fire. Yeah, so, so, so there's, there's the rub, I think, if, if we can find a, a compromise on the impact fee that they're paying already, mm -hmm. that money that rather than go into the fire suppression big picture, it's devoted to me. That, that's incentive right there, that if I'm going to pay X amount of dollars for a, uh, a, a, a impact fee and apply it to a residential sprinkler system, um, and then the other item, um, the, the density bonus, uh, you, you know, we started with, what did we say, 10%? That's what I thought, yeah. So, I'm frankly not, I haven't done any homework on the density bonus, but I think that, I think, is, is where, I mean, it's, it's economic impact to, to the builders, to the developers. They get an extra bonus, an extra unit, yeah. they, uh, they're going to look closely at this. But then again, if you have a, a, a development with 50 units in it, or, or even 25 units, 20 units, one extra unit may not do it 
for the cost of putting residential sprinklers in. So I, I, I'm not exactly sure where to look at. What is the cost of, what's the cost per home if, you, if you're putting in, you know, six or eight? Right, right so now, the, the $1.35 yeah. that's up there is So if it's 2,500 square feet, it's going to be a little over $3,000. It's, like, it's like two or three percent of the cost of a house now. So, so, so just come way down. In terms of the incentives that you're providing, whether or not, um, and I think part of, you know, the, the cisterns and the, the sprinklers go hand in hand because if, if they're not going to put in sprinklers, and you're, you're going to, we can we can require cisterns. We can't change the building code. Yeah, but, but if they put in but, sprinklers, but, but, they, incentive, but but if you if you have a requirement that they put cisterns in, but they can put this in as an alternative. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's that's one because you save the cost of, of the cisterns. Them, you, you that's the idea, right? Yeah. So yeah. Right. yeah, so so just to, to for the people. So that depending upon it. the type of development, having a a ten percent or an extra unit, maybe. <clears throat> maybe more than what you need. And you know, if you already have a requirement that they're going to have to put in some sort of fire suppression. So, but I, but I think we've, I mean, again, I think we've focusing on residential sprinklers and offering that real good incentive um, to do so. To quickly answer the question, I think I've, I've said it before, my, my daughter built a home in town with my son-in-law and uh, the cost of that was in the vicinity of $1.75 a square foot is what it costs. So, um, right here in Middletown. So again, focusing on the residential sprinklers, I think we've identified, and you know, I think our, you know, you, we can say it all day long that we support this, but I think we really need some some solid incentives, and I think we're on the right track. Ron, maybe you could help me out with. Uh, I, I know these same issues that we're talking about now. I brought up, and I lost my my notes from that particular meeting, but. Um, you know, we're still back to what type of density bonus, and we should probably sit down and try to find some resources to help us nail that down. Um, the impact fees, I think, are, are an area that we can find some, some solid incentive. Uh, obviously, writing some language in there relative to the dead end streets, the single access, the road width, um, that's easy. And, and obviously, the cisterns waiving that requirement. That we're going to make I don't know if we ran, acro ran across any other examples where density bonuses. Kevin, do you, do you remember if we ran it? Are there any examples? I actually thought I did see a density bonus as I was scanning through my notes. Yeah. Yeah, we, can, we can. I don't think so. So, we, it, I mean, we may not, not have run across any yet, but we can look deeper and to see if there are other places that do a density bonus. The other, the other thing that kind of spun from this. Sure. The other thing that kind of spun from this is I, I know this is this goes into our rules and regs. We're proposing to uh, add this into our rules and regs, but we did have discussion on offering if we if we find solid incentives such as a reduction in in the in the uh, impact fee, which is really the only one, and permit fee reduction is to offer this as a t not necessarily within the rules and regs for development of land, but just as a standalone. Uh, unit that's out there now, a standalone lot that's out there now, a, a, a town code, I guess, ordinance that provides some incentive. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, not, not necessarily obviously yeah. take away all of the, the, the road width and all of that, but the, the or the density bonus. But if, if I have a single lot of record out there now and I want a duplex, potential duplex lot, uh, incentivizing them to put in sprinklers in those new units. That goes a little bit beyond where we are and looking at the I understand that, but I just, it was discussed and I just want to keep it out there is, you know, if we continue on this, on this path of, of this language that's here and answer some of those questions, I think the impact fee is something we can hang our hat on to offer this to, to everyone. Well, impact fees only apply for newly created lots, so it's not going to solve the problem you just brought up of a, of a pre-existing lot or even a, an existing home that they want to retrofit. The impact fee doesn't apply there. There's no impact fee on a lot of record? No. There used to be, though. No. Any lots that were created, I, I forget lots. the date, it's well, okay, 2004 so. or something like that. Any lots that existed prior to 2004? Okay, so I, I, I think I, re I recall that discussion. Yeah. So, I, so I, I still think 
it's worthy, to, worthy of discussion once we finish this exercise, it, assuming we're going this direction, to have more discussion on, on proposing something for the town code to allow for uh, some bonus, some incentive to allow the average, even the lots of record that exist today. If somebody wants to build a new home, knock down a home, not a historic home, knock down a home and, and rebuild it, uh, but with an incentive to put in residential sprinklers. Um, I think that discussion is worthy of having also. Okay, uh, hold on, BJ, next. Well, I've almost forgotten what I was going to say during, during the, uh, the Bill's diatribe, but I do agree mostly with everything you said, except for one thing. I do think very strongly that a development should have an ingress and an egress. There should be a way in and way out, and not just one single road. And that comes from my being on the planning board for many years in the town of Coventry, where the town of Coventry uh, had an ordinance finally that said and advised most developers that that was true. They had to have an in and an out, an egress and an ingress. But other than that, I really think so I agreed with that. So rather, right. than, rather than finish, let me just say, Ron, regardless of where we go, I'm glad to sit with you and, and answer those questions. Get, get into the, rather than keep doing this exercise, I, I will make a point of sitting with you and, and, mm -hmm. and coming to a better written document that we can work with. Right. Well, I think two things. Uh, the first one is I, I think it'd be worthwhile to go out to the people that, that provide home insurance and find out, say, with a 2,000 square foot home, what the uh, fire insurance would be for a, a home with a cistern or a sprinkle system. I think that number is valuable for, for all of us, and I think for a homeowner, it might make some sense. On bills, I, I was just thinking about wouldn't it be a great idea if everybody on the east side converted the sprinklers? But we've got a whole new problem there because this, you're going to retrofit and do all the plumbing to accommodate sprinklers. It's probably going to be a lot more expensive than a new house at $1.75. Yeah. Retrofit is difficult. Yeah, it's a very yeah. difficult, more yeah, expensive yeah. thing. But I think that taking a look at the fire insurance, uh, again, might be useful. Um, I, I have a question. If you can go back to the incentives uh, slide. Um, the fire department plan review fees, I assume these are fees to pay for a review by the fire department? Right. And what are they reviewing for? To ensure compliance with the fire code. Uh, meaning what? I mean, why would you waive that if they get sprinklers? It's, well, you don't have to. It's a, the idea is you're incentivizing them to put yeah. the sprinklers in by waiving that fee. So well, uh, the, uh, it's kind of part of the impact fee idea. Well, no, no. It's, to me, it's different from the impact fee. The impact fee is a good incentive in my mind. But the plan review, I'm assuming the fire department is making sure that they can access the property if they need to. Mm -hmm. And they may still need to access property even if they have sprinklers because sometimes yeah. mistakes No, we're happen. not saying that the review true. isn't going to happen. We're just saying that they, the fee, the you fee. wouldn't have to pay for the review. So they don't review all plans? Fine I'm not, I don't know what the threshold is for review, right. but oh, really? so, only for so this isn't smoke detectors. Really? Hmm? Only for in a single family dwelling, only for placement of smoke detectors. But, but also, if, if we had a major subdivision going yeah. in, the planning and the fire department would be reviewing to make sure that there was adequate access and yes. circulation, okay. emergency vehicles, yes. and those things. And would they, they would still, still be do doing that. The question is whether or not the fees would be. Oh, so they, they, they would still do the review Absolutely. even, even yeah, if the, the fees yes. are... Oh, yeah. Yeah, oh, yeah, I wasn't suggesting that the review okay. would go away. I'm fine. The fee goes away. Yeah, no, no, the fee... Just so not, just the fee goes away, the review stays. Yes. yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. Fees and, and plan <laughs> review fees and permit fees. Okay, so I'm fine. In that area. Okay. Uh, let's hear from the public. Any uh, input from the public on this? You all like residential sprinklers or you all don't like residential sprinklers? <laughs> <laughs> No, co so no comments from the public? It's so exciting. <laughs> well, we've got some more work to do on this one as well. So. Yeah, why don't, why don't we get another draft on this and, and take a look at it before we do anything? Sure. I'll commit to coming in and helping Ryan. Great. I don't want to Thank keep you. hanging you out there. I apologize for that. Any other discussion on this? Okay, so uh, the action here will be to prepare a, a, a draft based on these comments. Yeah. Okay. More, re um, more research. Yep. 
I, I'm going to help with that. I promise. Do we need the motion to adjourn? Well, before that, I just want to remind everyone we have a site visit at uh, 3 p.m. on Friday. Two site visits. Right. Uh, starting at the Goldstein property? Starting at Goldstein at 3 and then 3.40 at Shelton. Shelton. Okay. Any other business to come before the board? We have a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Second. Motion is made and seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Meeting is adjourned. Thank, Thank you. you.